Dear Ajahn, thank you for guiding us through the contemplation of death and dying. I found it very useful. I plan to make it a part of my practice. A couple of questions. Is there a Lord of Death, just as there is Mara and Brahma? So apparently there is. His name is, is it Yamaraja? In Thai it's Yamarat, a uh, grim reaper character. Okay, the Buddha does talk about, he mentions a Lord of Death in Sutras, doesn't he? I think he does, yeah. I'm fairly sure I've seen it even in the Sutras, the Lord Buddha mentioning the Lord of Death. Even the Christians, apparently they say the Grim Reaper, he has kind eyes. He comes and touches you on the shoulder. Being touched by the Grim Reaper means your number's up. So apparently there is. And uh, in a way, if one is peaceful enough, and if one sees that, suppose you're in and out of sleep, or you're dying from a disease, and people are taking care of you, and you see, that might be helpful with that sense of, better get ready. More practically, in the question, do we have any advice on dying a good death? If we have time before we die, what can we do, think or say to assist us in going to the best possible place for the next life? How important are the final thoughts in determining where we end up? So, I've asked, these kind of questions to Tanajananan and he said actually two things are the most important at the time of death. One is the kind of life you've lived and the level that the mind has been at habitually. So if you kept the five precepts mostly your mind would have been on the level of a human. If you didn't keep the five precepts most of the time your mind would have been on a less than human level even though you had a human body and uh, if you kept the precepts, meditated often, listened to Dhamma, practiced generosity, you may have had a deva mind, even though you had a human body, a lot of the time. So that is affecting, the level of consciousness at death is obviously affected by where it's been throughout the life, mostly. Then the other thing which is most important is the mind state at death. Not necessarily the thought, but the, the vibration, the, the level, the energy level. And Tanajan, he says in general that if ever we become depressed, we should be quite determined to shift through that quickly. A depressed mind uh, is dark and clouded. It's actually more, it's like on a ghost level. So even as a human being, if you become depressed, the mind is kind of hanging out on a ghost realm. So he encourages us to be active about doing good things and contemplating, trying to focus on positives and shift the mind state quickly, if possible. One tradition I heard about in Sri Lanka, which I think is really beautiful and skillful, is to make a ledger of all of the kind and skillful things that you do. We actually write down I made offerings at such and such a temple. I visited such and such a person in the hospice. I went on pilgrimage. And even in detail, I paid respects to Bodh Gaya. I paid respects in Sana. I paid respects in Lumbini. I, you know, the details of the good things that you've done. And so you can imagine if you make a habit of doing good things and you do it for decades, you're going to have quite a book there. And so relatives of sick people, if you, if you do have a time to prepare for death, will remind you. Do you remember that time that you co-sponsored a Katina? Do you remember that time that you went to the holy sites in India? And if we make a particular effort to pay respects to monks that we hear are well practiced, do do you remember that time you paid respects to Ajahn Blian? Do you remember the time you went and paid respects to Ajahn Biak? And so we make this habit of doing things which are very skillful, that make good karma, and you make a list. All of the well-practiced monks and nuns you paid respects to, all of the holy sites you paid respects to, 
all of the offerings and even the small kind deeds. You might have several books. And uh, this is very skillful because we do have a habit of focusing on the negative. And if, if the mind gets depressed, more so. When the mind gets depressed, we focus on the negative because the kind of the energy is low, so it dwells on the dark side. So I think that's very skillful. And even if, even if someone isn't there to read it, if you yourself, every time you're filling it in, you review the good acts that you've done, you feel inspired to do more. And uh, suppose no one's there to read it to you, you can remind yourself. Meditation retreats, how many meditation retreats? And how many hours of sitting? It was kind of once a month, you can fill in in the last month, I've done 30 hours of meditation. Last month I've done 60 hours of meditation. And just kind of, you can have different chapters, the meditation chapter, the dana chapter, the paying respects chapter, the kind deeds. And so that is skillful. And this is chaganusati, recollecting uh, self-sacrificing gestures, but also recollecting generosity, even the precepts, well not, not even the precepts, keeping precepts is powerful. It's a powerful practice that produces merit. So you can just write down another month of keeping the precepts strictly. If you do, you know, just make, make a note of that. That's refraining from doing things is actually doing something because uh, it requires effort. We have, to, we have to put forth effort to maintain our sila. So if another year goes by and you're strict in your precepts, that's another year I get the precepts. So I think that's very skillful. Then uh, this intention to keep practicing. And uh, recollecting, doing this as a practice before you get sick and old, every now and then, to um, recollect the good things that you've done as a meditation. And it's not like self-congratulatory and be really careful about getting competitive about how much merit one makes, because it can go that way. Boasting or being proud, that's not the point. The point is to rejoice in the goodness and gladden the mind. And especially if you have a self-deprecating, uh, self-aversive habit, you can balance the perception. And actually the percentage of human beings that really make an effort to keep precepts is very small. So unfortunately that means most human beings are probably going to ghost and animal realms next life. So this is, this is dangerous because I have one friend who's so proud of himself for giving up alcohol after drinking for 30 years. Sometimes he gets a little proud. He thinks he's saint-like for having been able to give up alcohol. <laughs> And it is, a, it is an accomplishment and it is a good thing, but it's not yet sainthood. So we, you know, we, we also have to do that bit more that we can do. What do you do if it is a car crash and the last moments are pain, bone crushing pain? That's one of the things the metta practice has a protective quality. So if you do a lot of metta, it produces merit and it has a protective quality, so decreasing the chances of having an inauspicious painful death if you practice a lot of metta. Another benefit of metta practice, uh, devas protect those that cultivate metta. I think another thing with regards to death and dying is being willing to let go. So you get the sense sometimes people in these old sick bodies that they're hanging on with fear and attachment and sometimes we might not have a choice, we might not realize how attached we are until we get to that point but just to kind of say to yourself when it's time to go, go. As a, as a kind of a training, that when it's time to go, be ready to go. Because if you hang on to the body as it gets weaker, the mind has less and less energy and the mind gets more depressed. 
in many cases. So if the cancer is spreading all throughout the body and the mind's getting a bit weak, and you can actually make a determination, a resolution, I'm going to leave this body as soon as I can. And that's not suicide. It's the body is dying and people can prolong that death by hanging on. But if you just allow the natural process and just say to yourself, don't hang on unnecessarily, if it's time to go, it's time to go. I know in Japan, Japanese Buddhists pray to Sitigaba Bodhisattva that they might die fast and peaceful deaths because he's a bodhisattva that's related to people at difficult crossroads so old people go and pray may I die a fast peaceful death may I not be a burden to my children they actually do this it's an interesting practice Sitikaba is a uh, what's his name in Chinese? it's Ti uh, Chang Huang Ti Chang Huang Pusa one of those things, if you have faith in Ti Chang Huang, you can ask for some help at the crossroads. Devanusati, recollecting deities. So many of you have, you've just grown up with Kuan Yin, many of the Chinese Malaysians, you've just grown up offering incense to her and there's temples to her everywhere. And so it's okay to pray the understanding that you're praying to, not to a god, but to a deva, with great metta. So it's okay if one has a strong faculty of faith. This practice of devanusati, which is mentioned in the Visuddhimagga, is for people with a strong faith faculty. So if you have faith in Kuan Yin, if that's there, that's part of your merit, then you can pray, and you can ask, come and guide me. If you don't have a strong faculty of faith, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. But you can tell Kuan Yin, I want to go and practice. Guide me to where I can practice. Now some people, one practitioner was telling me today that as she falls asleep, she's with Amitofo, Amitofo, Amitofo. And when she wakes up, Amitofo. Well, that's very good. And uh, if you're practicing Buddha, you want to practice to that to that level that you can fall asleep butto butto and wake up butto butto if we if we recollect it often enough it'll be there it's something that's karmically generated volitionally generated so if you generate it enough it'll be there so in the talk that I read of Ajahnanan he was saying not just in breath meditation but throughout daily activities to just do this butto 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 have a little bit of that buddho there all the time, as much as you can, because it restrains how much restlessness and how much hindrances and how much kilesa actually swells up in the mind if you hang on to a bit of it. One of the values of contemplating the possibility that we could die today is that if it happens all of a sudden, there's that part of you that's ready. It's like, oh, I knew it could happen. And if we don't, if we get a bit rusty on our death contemplation, it's amazing how quickly we start to take life for granted and grasp again and don't think about death. There's this assumption it'll be later. So it is a good daily practice. Rajan Anand was recommending when you read the newspapers and you see that other people died, that you just acknowledge that could have been me. That could have been me. We see the news, we get this voyeuristic, oh look what happens to other people, feel sorry for them. And to kind of soften our complacency, it could have been me. Why wasn't it me? So that kind of thing, preparing the mind with frequent recollection and challenging the assumption that you won't die. You do this it doesn't make the mind depressed actually. I suppose if you did it all day it would. And if you do it with mindfulness it wouldn't. With Arjuna Nun's practice his mind became more and more radiant, more and more uh, peaceful, more and more blissful because he had enough samadhi that it wasn't, he wasn't just using thoughts. 
but with us who are using reflective thought, it's a way to just sober the mind and wake up, let go of a bit of attachment, and you do it a few times a day.